if you're looking for a ticket to popularity, you might do better being a secular humanist. And so there is a, there is a somberness about that. And then the same thing happens in the 34th Psalm, the section that we read toward the end. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears them. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. There's that same kind of divine that's laid out. And then Jesus does precisely the same thing. The context of the lesson has to do with Jesus actually comparing himself with John the Baptist. John the Baptist is out there preaching and the disciples want to know what's up with him. And they're out in the wilderness, they see it happening, and then Jesus begins to explain his role and John's role. But in so doing, talks about people's responding to him as the Son of God. The one who comes from above is above all. That's Jesus, the Son of God who has come down from heaven. So he is, number one, above all. By contrast, the one who is of the earth, meaning John the Baptist, belongs to the earth and speaks about earthly things. In other words, he speaks from a different perspective. He is a human being empowered by God to do what God says. But he is not one who has come down from heaven and belongs, in fact, to heaven. John's just a regular human being, just like all of us. Jesus, however, as we say over and over again, is God from God, light from light, true God from true God, to quote the, the creed. There is, in fact, a distinct difference between Jesus and John, even though, in fact, tradition indicates they're first cousins. And he keeps going. The one who comes from heaven is above all. He has a different perspective. And he testifies to what he has seen and heard. He speaks about, as he says earlier and later, about heavenly things. What we would call, to use our language, he talks about ultimate. <coughs> Life and death. Eternity. The real role of the Son of God is the one who comes to bind God and man together through reconciliation and the forgiveness of sins. P.S. I, I did a two-night healing ministry at All Saints Square Park last night. And one of the things that I tried to make a profound point about, we'll see how profound it is, is that the point of Jesus' life and message and teaching, if you were to boil it down to a nutshell, is not love one another. That's not the essence of Jesus' teaching. Nor is it the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The, the heartbeat, the essence of what it means to be Christian, the heart of Jesus' teaching is, your sins are forgiven. That's the heart of Jesus' teaching. And it is in fact the forgiveness of sins and the cleansing of His blood that makes loving one another not an altruism, but in fact a genuine possibility. Because God's Spirit is at work, giving us something that we can never <laughs> receive on our own. So, this is, so Jesus emphasizes that, because he's speaking from a heavenly perspective. He's talking about ultimate things. He testifies, the one comes from above, the Son of God, because he testifies what? What he has seen and heard. But yet, what happens? No one accepts his testimony. He is going and is going to go through a time of, in fact, rejection. We know that. Despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrow, and equated with grief. But whoever has accepted his testimony, the ones who do begin to follow him, certify that he is true. They understand that he speaks correctly. He, in fact, comes from God. He's not deluded. He speaks hard things, but they are in fact true things. He speaks the word of God. And how is that possible? Because God gives his spirit to the Son without measure. In other words, there's this connecting flow that literally flows through the Trinity into the incarnate Son of God. It's our first sort of glimpse of Trinitarian language in the Gospel. For the Father loves the Son and has placed all things in his hands. In other words, he is the one who holds 
holds all truth, all creation is the Son, all that there is, literally in His hands, meaning under His control and under His authority. It's a very high view of who Jesus is as the incarnate Son of God. Critically important because He says something very radical. And if you don't believe the preceding stuff, you're going to think the next step is ludicrous. Because He says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. That's not possible. The gift of eternal life is not possible if you believe anything less than who Jesus is, is God from God, light from light. Because there is only one who literally holds eternity in his hands. And that is the Holy Trinity of God. And so if God is flowing through him, and we can enter into a relationship with God through the Son, then it makes sense that we inherit the very eternal nature of God himself. But if he is not that, then we do not have eternal life. You can't have one without the other. So whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But, by contrast, here's the divide again. Whoever disobeys the Son will not see life, but instead endures God's wrath. Now, Episcopalians don't like wrath. (laughs) It's really not a part of our being. We want to be the kind of church that really accepts everybody regardless. And therefore, wrath is not a very attractive part of of the equation. But you can't be a biblical Christian without making a place for that and wrestling for it. So within this context, what do we mean when we talk about wrath? If I do not believe in the Son, that means, and if the Son is, in fact, God's revelation of Himself... God incarnate calling the world of Father, then I am by my very disbelief standing in opposition to the clarity and the truth of that revelation. There is no such thing. Jesus makes it so very clear that if I say, well, I don't believe and I just kind of walk away, that I'm in some sort of neutral zone. That does not exist within the spiritual realm. Just as a point of principle, there is no spiritual neutral zone, period. It doesn't exist. And so if I choose, for whatever reason, to say no to what has been revealed, then at that point I operate in opposition to God's purposes. Even if I'm a really nice guy, I still at that point am operating in opposition to God's purposes. So what does God do at that point? How, what is his response? His response is to oppose my opposition for my good. Because if he bless my opposition, that would only confirm the truth of what I believe. But what I'm believing is a falsehood. And so God, if he is true, must oppose that. That I might in fact be one to himself. That is the very essence and the nature. In other words, wrath and love are never in opposition to each other. Just the opposite. Wrath is an expression of love. Bringing about the consequences of disbelief that I in fact might be called to repentance and faith. That's the essence of all this. You can't put God into several different categories. Well, I believe in the God of love of Jesus, and I don't believe in the God of wrath. The scripture does not allow us to pick and choose as if somehow attributes were about fate. Instead, Jesus is laying out a very, if we believe that he is, in fact, the word made flesh, he is the accuracy of what he says about the nature of God is critically important to our learning. So, what does that call for us? Actually, what it's meant to call from us is boldness. That's what's going on in the Exodus. And that's the collect. Because God has given this Paschal mystery called reconciliation. Help us to believe, to show forth in our lives what we profess by our faith. That's the collect for this week. Because if Jesus is, in fact, God's revelation of himself, who he is supernaturally raised from the dead, that he is, in fact, who he says who he is, and we who belong 
as men and women of the resurrection, of resurrection are called to speak with clarity and to live with sincerity and truth that the world, in fact, might believe. It's particularly important now. We live in a society where the church is extraordinarily suspect. And therefore, to be men and women who operate with generosity, with compassion, that are actively involved for the sake of Christ, not just within the boundaries of our church, but out there in the community, is not less important now. It's, in fact, more important. People just don't happen to drop into church much anymore. And if he is, in fact, who he says he is, and if God has been the one who has redeemed us from sin and death, then we also know that resurrection power and are invited and called in the Easter season to, in essence, get out there. So the prayer is, in the light of the uniqueness of who he is, oh Lord, may I be one that is unafraid to testify to who you are. To be a bold witness because you have raised Jesus from the dead and have raised me from sin and death to the new life of grace. Amen. Amen. Amen.